The stages of Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and Broadway were the home to Laura Ozanez for 15 years until 2021. And Laura rose to stardom after winning NBC's reality TV competition, Grease, You're the One That I Want, earning her the role of Sandy in the Broadway revival of Grease at the age of 21. And she also earned Tony Award nominations for Bonnie Parker and Bonnie and Clyde and in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella and starred in five Hallmark Channel movies as well as releasing two albums. And that's just the short version of her accomplishments. But then a tabloid published a false narrative that fueled a cyber storm of accusations. And in an instant, Laura's reputation and the path of her career were changed forever. Refusing to be a victim of cancel culture, Laura Osnes is finding her voice again. And Laura's debut EP, On the Other Side, Part 1, chronicles this past year's journey of standing up, starting over, building strength, and finding hope on the other side of cancellation. Today, Laura and her husband, Nathan, are here with us to tell their story. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Laura Osnes and her husband, Nathan Johnson, to the show. Welcome. It's great to be here. Hi, Dr. Ward. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Well, I want to step back into the past a bit. So prior to 2021, what was your career like on Broadway and in television? Um, I, w I was so grateful to have kind of a 14 year run on Broadway. I did six Broadway shows playing leading roles. As you said, two Tony nominations uh, for two of those roles. Theater was something I always wanted to do. I feel like I've been a storyteller since before I could walk and talk. I was singing and dancing. And um, I did my first musical theater production in second grade and the theater bug bit and I knew that's what I wanted to do like my entire life. And I'm so grateful that I got to do it in New York for a, a considerably long time. Well, Nathan, you actually look like an actor with model looks. Are you in that uh, industry? You know what? I used to be in the industry and now I'm on a different side, photographer now and a filmmaker. Um, but we actually met, uh, you know, working together at one point about 16, 17 years ago. And Doing so a musical. I come from that world. Yes. Oh, so you were also into, uh, well, I guess into the Broadway industry. Yeah. Musical theater. I, I never quite made it on Broadway. Uh, tried it, tried my hand at it in New York for about a year and realize this is not the industry for me, but I do, I, I do enjoy being in the industry and working. I did, worked on a lot of shows, uh, shooting show posters and that sort of thing. Worked on Bonnie and Clyde and Bandstand with Laura as well. And um, had a good go of it in New York as well. But Nate is very musical and I think you always loved it as a hobby. We met understudying the leads in a production back in Minnesota. This was before I had ever, you know, done the Broadway thing um, in 2007. So we met and got married doing that show and then moved to New York together. Oh, so y'all were already married by the time you struck it big with Greece. Yes. Yep, that's right. Wow. You know, it's funny because I don't normally uh, see people get married that young yep. anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but I guess when you find the right one, you right. know, why, why wait? But why for wait. both <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I was telling both Laura and Nathan that they look like this picture perfect couple that literally should be that photo when we go by a frame because look, they're beautiful people. So very kind of you to say that. Honor. <laughs> well, for both of you, what was and I'm gonna pose this question to both of you. So how was the transition from going to musical theater to film or Laura from Broadway to television? Yeah, it's very interesting. They are very different art forms, even though they're still, you know, both acting, obviously. But I, I grew up feeling like the stage was my home. That's where I felt most confident. That's where I knew how to shine. And I went through years where I never booked TV film work. I would audition and never book it. And I just began to think, this isn't my thing. I should stick to the stage. And then I randomly got offered a Hallmark movie uh, in 2000, I think it was 18, 2018 okay, was my yeah. first one. And uh, the, dire the the character had to sing. And so a friend of mine who worked part-time at Hallmark put my name in the hat and the director happened to know who I was and I got a straight offer. And I was terrified because I thought I have very little experience being behind a camera. And now all of a sudden I have to lead this movie. And um, after literally the first day on set, I 
uh, that my fears were qualmed a little bit going, okay, I think it was just fear of the unknown. And I, very, I was very humble with the director. And I said, I am new at this. Please take me under your wing and help me. And I learned so much and ended up having a, a wonderful time and was so grateful that Hallmark had been loyal to me and had me back for a few more films. Well, you know, the great thing about, you know, like a Hallmark channel or Lifetime, you know, w when they film the movies, I think the great thing for the actors is that these movies get played a lot. And so a lot of a lot of people, a lot of viewers find out who you are because they, they see the movie over and over again or they see multiple movies in which you appear in. And to me, I think it's just a, a great move for anyone's career. Thanks. Yeah, it was a very safe place to learn and opened me up to a whole new audience. The Broadway audience fan base, you know, was loyal for, you know, a long time, but it's very niche. And I feel like you can reach so many more people one night on television through a Hallmark film than you can months and months and months on Broadway. There's a thousand people in this in the theater every night, but then there's millions tuning into uh, you know, a Hallmark Channel it's, movie. It's also fun to see how there's such a different generation to you. We've got some younger folks that watch it, but then all of a sudden you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, my grandmother loves it as well. Yeah. You know, she has it on all seasons. So those are, it's kind of nice. It did sweet. help. It did help me reach the, a whole new audience. And Hallmark has found a niche as well. There, I am even now being here in Tennessee, people recognize me more from Hallmark movies than they ever, than they do from Broadway. So um, it's, I'm very grateful. Well, yeah, because with Broadway, that's a New York thing. And if you don't live there, a lot of people will never see a Broadway show um, unless they ever take it, to, take it to Vegas or, you know, and I do know a lot of the Broadway shows do travel yep. to the major cities, but a lot of people may not step out to buy a ticket, but television always seems to be that uh, venue, uh, that outlet where people really you know, find out who you really are. Um, yeah, and, you know, it's just, I don't know, you know, with Hallmark, you, it, it's funny that you say that the, even the age groups, you know, I, I get the whole point of when people say, oh yeah, my, my grandmother watched that, watched that movie. Well, to me, that's Hallmark or, or <laughs> Lifetime for that matter. But no, but, but the age is getting younger because those movies are more wholesome. They're more family oriented. If you want to watch something clean, those are the channels you want to go to. And in this day and age, we need more of that. And right. not only that, there's Christmas yeah. in July. Right, exactly. <laughs> there is a little bit of a lack of, and uh, you know, you can't just turn on something and think, oh, this is going to be fine for my whole family to watch. Right. Hallmark, you can do that. GAC, you, you can do that. And um, I think people like that. Now, Laura, for you, you had two albums prior to this brand new EP. When did you actually record those two albums? Yes, the first album I made was a live album of a concert, a cabaret concert that I did in New York City at the Cafe Carlisle, which is a very kind of prestigious and historic hotel with this famous cabaret room. And I was fortunate enough to play two weeks there uh, several years ago. I think it was in 2011. And uh, we did a live recording of that concert. And so that is my first album. And it's all covers. It's all musical theater songs and uh, pop and standards and things that I've narrated into the storytelling of my life a little bit. And then there's some banter in between. So again, you feel like you get to know me a little bit. And then my second album is also a musical theater album um, with the music of Maury Yeston, who is a Broadway composer. He's done several Broadway shows. And I did a live concert of his work and he loved it so much that he approached me and was like, we should record this. And I was grateful enough to get to make it in a studio, but it's very, again, very niche. And then this new EP is all original work. I have never considered songwriting. I've, my whole life, I've brought other people's work to life and I've gotten to tell other people's stories. And now for the first time, I'm finding my voice and my, I'm getting to share my stories in my own words. And that's something that's really been powerful um, about this new EP. Yeah, and we're going to get to that brand new EP. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you this, and, and many of you who watch my show, you know that I love doing my homework. And, and when it comes to albums, I will listen to them over and over and over again. And Laura, I've listened to this EP 
and and we're going to get to those songs and the meaning of those songs but wow you have an incredible voice but the songs are there and and we're going to get to the stories behind some of those songs but i absolutely love the songs the music that you have created but i want to step back because i want you to tell us both of you what happened in the summer of 2021 and can you explain the tabloid article that came out about you that changed the course of your life and career? Yes, um, thank you. I'm honored that you listened and that you loved it. Um, but yes, all of this 14 year career in New York City, getting to do what I love and loving on the people that I got to do it with was totally halted. Obviously the industry was hit pretty hard when COVID hit. Um, and so I think a lot of people were living in a lot of fear and anxiety. And uh, last summer, August of 2021, I was essentially, just to, to make it short, canceled in the New York Post for not being vaccinated. I had been hired for a one night concert gig on Long Island, basically as a favor for a friend. I was getting paid practically nothing to do it. And suddenly the venue was um, mandating the vaccine and the director reached out to everybody privately in the cast and was asking everybody's status. And I was honest, at the time I wasn't vaccinated. I hadn't made any sort of public statement one way or the other. I just was kind of, you know, um, I had made that I, we weren't currently vaccinated and I was honest with her and said that I said, I guess I'll have to back out of this concert. Love you. Hope we get to work again soon. She was like, great. Totally understand. We'll miss you. The end. And then a week later, there was an article that came out saying I was fired for refusing to get vaccinated. And the article went on to kind of defame me and mischaracterize me, my reputation and how the events happened. Um, it said I was vague about my status, which transferred into a narrative that on a firestorm of comments online that I had lied about my status, which was clearly not true. In fact, I, I look back now and feel like I was punished for being truthful. Well, how um, did the Post even find out about this one night show that you would have done that most people would have even know existed? I don't know. Apparently somebody, somebody must have had it, it out for me. <laughs> but it was, it's amazing when you actually read the article, we were going through it and we're like, well, that, that conversation never happened. It said that her co-star begged her for the sake of his children to get vaccinated. And she's like, well, he, A, like he only has one child. He has one child. B, we never had that conversation. And then when it talked about her being vague, when asked about her status, it's like, how, how can you be less vague than just saying, you know the, what, I'm not, I'm going to have to back out of this. And the, so the article I, also had said that the theater's policy was to provide proof of vaccination or proof of a negative test. I had been testing to work the entire pandemic. I mean, I'd made three Hallmark movies during the pandemic, testing all the time, definitely willing to do that. I was never given that option for this one night concert. Yeah. And I think back now and I'm like, had I been given that option to test, could this entire thing had been have been avoided? <laughs> um, well, yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Laura, because do you feel like that you were singled out because the media was actually looking for a story to exploit those who either refused the jab or wasn't going to look at actually getting it? And I will put this in parentheses because of the lack of science on the vaccine. I've yeah. talked to others that said, my doctor told me not to do it. Yes. You know, I've had three doctors tell me not to do it. Right. And yes. so for you, I mean, you think that the post is just looking for someone to exploit because I've talked to so many people in entertainment and we all know that in 2020, nobody was doing it. No, you know, recording act, acts weren't touring, but then when 2021 hit, especially when it started to be around April, May, that's when all of these venues started coming up with these rules about show proof of vaccination. Unfortunately, you were in New York and between New York and California, the two toughest states when it came to venues. Right. To me, I think the Post is just looking for someone to hang out to dry. Yeah, it's really disheartening to see how only one opinion and one narrative was allowed within the entertainment industry. And I think New York is part of that, but I think the entertainment industry specifically is very one-sided. And 
everybody kind of, um, it, it seemed that the industry very much took that and used their platforms for advocacy. And I've, I've never been political. I've never, you know, I sing and dance and that's what I choose to put out into the world through my social media. And I think because I wasn't being public about any of that and never have been, and still I'm not, um, I, yes, I think there was kind of a target on my back and the, the mantra became silence is violence during that time. And it's really such a shame because I'm, I'm not out to hurt anybody. I'm, I am very understanding. I think everybody should have the right to choose. I have no judgment toward anybody that made a different decision than I did. And yeah. we, you know, we, for me, it came down to yes, medically, we were advised not to get it. Same, same situation. And there were so many unknowns at that time about the vaccine. Um, secondly, I value freedom and I think everybody should have the right to choose what is right for them and how they feel. And well, third one of the things that kind of struck me really odd, and there's a lot of hypocrisy here. Right. First of all, uh, I've read the story where rapper Ice Cube refused the jab and he lost a $9 million movie deal, yep. but he wasn't canceled. Now, there have been a few sports stars, mostly in basketball, that said no and right. got thrown under the bus. Right. Um, but what I find very odd is because all of the hypocrisy in the entertainment industry, there are many who refused, never said a word about it. Right. Nobody crucified them in the press. And there, there may have been a couple. But in the entertainment industry, here you are. And you're reading this newspaper article from the Post. And we know how newspapers and even magazines are. They can make up anything they want at the drop of a hat. And the generalized public will believe, believe every word that they read. Not understanding that most of this stuff is made up. Right. Right. With all the people that you worked with, and then you're getting canceled by people in Broadway. You're getting canceled by people in film. They know the hypocrisy. So why would they cancel you instead of sticking up for you? One thing I will say this, that like this happened very early on. So I don't, we, we try to think if anyone had been publicly canceled or, you know, and there was no, basketball stars, there was Aaron Rodgers and Kyrie and all these We're other, all a few that, months that was after always a, a little bit after. And I feel like early on, it was, it seemed very quickly when this happened to Laura, you know, we have a lot of other friends that are in similar boats and they were, I mean, very quickly, they were like, well, I can see what, I see what, what can happen to me if I speak up or if I just choose to, you know, I'm, you know they kind of just backed away from everything because they just didn't want to be found out or didn't want to have to deal with that. And very quickly, um, you know, I, I think people can look to Laura's situation and go, oh, you know, if you don't, if you don't get in line, you're going to get called out and, and you could lose your career. And that's, it's kind of heartbreaking, especially for younger actors coming up too. Well, Laura, for you and, and Nathan, I want you to come in on this one. Yeah. That what, what is it like? And then a lot of people don't understand this. What is it like to actually be completely silenced, having no way to correct a narrative that is completely false. Uh, we know the topic of COVID and the vaccines are still to this day very polarizing, people using them as political weapons. Um, and for one thing, the media just won't let it go. Um, and we know that a lot, of, a lot of, most of the public now won't even go near them. So what was it like to be silenced to the point to where you really couldn't even correct the narrative? And then Nathan, what was it like for you to see all this happening to your wife? Because as a husband, you know, we want to fix things. Right. Uh, I just, my heart just sinks even thinking about it. It was the hardest thing I've ever gone through. Um, it's, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible because I think it was a community and people that I loved and had invested in. And I feel like a lot of my identity was in that. And when that whole thing was taken away and nobody could publicly stand up or defend and the hateful messages, so hateful, people were cruel privately to me, directly to me via text and publicly all over my Instagram. And I did try to craft a response. We crafted a response and put it out five days later in an effort to tell the truth about what happened and how this went down and and get my heart behind the issue which only made things worse because um 
I knew I wasn't going to change people's minds, but I did feel like if I'm going down here, I'm going down with dignity and I'm standing up for myself. I'm not apologizing. I did nothing wrong here. And I was just made to be out such a, such a demon, such a horrible person, because that was the narrative at the time. And um, it, it was really hard. And I'm so grateful for Nate. <laughs> I feel like we, we clung to the things that are unshakable. And for us, that was family, each other. Luckily, our families were very supportive during this time. We lost all our friends, but we got to keep our family. <laughs> well, I see that was actually, that's actually my next question, because during this ordeal, did you learn who your real friends are? For sure. Yeah. And I think I've been friends with all of our New York community knowing that we thought differently on some things, yeah, you know, fine. and that's fine with us. That's absolutely fine. Again, no judgment toward anybody, but suddenly this one thing was so polarizing that everyone felt like they had to distance themselves. And even friends who tried to be friends didn't know how to be friends because every time we would talk about it, they had to make sure they knew that they didn't agree but they cared about me, but they don't agree. And they're trying to convince me to get vaccinated. And couldn't do that publicly because then that maybe would say- uh, Any association would, would look get like them they canceled. agreed with. And I, I think for me, you know, looking at this, this was, it was extremely difficult because Laura's always worked very hard to have a, a just a great reputation. Her cast, I mean, was always respected her. She took care of them, you know, was uh, her work ethic was always, she was always the last one calling out of, out of shows showed up on time, you know? And so to have this stuff come in there and, and this narrative saying Laura lied about her vaccination status, she put people at risk. It's like, it's just so, uh, so contrary to who she, I know her to be. And so what we really tried to do this last year, especially is, you know, attack this cancel culture thing together um, mm -hmm. that, you know, we do everything, you know, as partners. And so, you know, we just said, you know what, if, if, it, if, if it's happening to you, it's happening to me. And let's go it together. And I, I, I think that it's been uh, that's helped us get through the last. Well, you know. I was going to ask you, Nathan, because when here's the entertainment industry, and I really wish to say the media, okay, yeah. trying to cancel Laura. Did any of that backlash hurt you in your own work? Well, I mean, I think at, at some point I had a business, you know, and just a little backstory. I had a business in New York City. I had a photography studio in the West Chelsea area. And, you know, I, I'm, I was affected by a different mandate, and that was the, the closure of business, small businesses. So I was already crushed that year, you know, four or five months not being able to have business and then business being slow to resume. So that was already something that that had affected my business. But it just became very apparent we weren't going to be able to stay in New York City. It didn't feel like a, a safe place for us to be anymore. So, uh, of course, that affects my life. And that's one of the things that it affects other it affects family members. It affects a whole our family. Whole life changed, and so, yeah. you know, it, it, it made sense for us to pick up our whole life and transfer it down to Nashville. And, um, and there's been really wonderful things that have come out of that. So, I mean, I, while this has been very difficult, there's also been a silver lining to this and a grace that's been upon it and new relationships that have been uh, just incredible. I wanted to go back to that thing about feeling silenced too, because I did. Mm -hmm. And even when I, even when two months later, I finally posted something again, uh, like a picture with my family. And I was like grateful for these people, like hateful comments, just hate, hate, hate. How dare you put your family at risk? How dare, like, and I was like, whoa, I can't even try to put something good out in the world. And again, I'm not saying anything political. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. I know I'm not going to change people's minds. I'm just putting out another lovely photo. So what ended up happening is I, I started songwriting and I was encouraged by a mentor friend of mine to, to do that. And he paired me up with some amazingly kind, welcoming, receptive, open-hearted songwriters. And I started uh, co-writing music finally sharing my heart in that way that it, if anything else, it was going to be healing and it was going to be cathartic and give me something creative to do because I am a creative at the core of my being that was no longer allowed to create in the way that she had done for the last. 35. But isn't that, isn't that great? Cause I hear this from a lot of recording artists because I interview so many from Nashville and the Nashville area, how, how tight and how amazing the songwriting community is there's, there's not a feeling of competition. There's a feeling of mentorship. Um, there's an invitation, invitations, Hey, come in and, you know, write with us. And, uh, and I, there's a lot of healing there because now you have people that you can talk to and just kind of 
let your hair down and your breath out and relax. And I, I find Nashville to be a fantastic city. It was very healing for us. And that is ex the exact mentality. I was very surprised, actually. It's like you meet people within the industry and the moments after we got here, it was like, oh, I know someone that can help you. Or, oh, I need to introduce you to this person. And, oh, I'm having these people over for dinner. Come so you can meet them. And it's all a about connecting people and and trying to help people, especially new people. Um, we felt very welcomed here and found a community almost instantly. I didn't know what we were gonna do job-wise and how we were gonna like make a living. Yeah, it was an interesting year, but. <laughs> in the community, we found new community here almost immediately and that was the biggest blessing. Yeah, and, and I think in, in times like that, God has that silent guiding hand and yep. even when we don't know, he knows, but then you just start seeing all the pieces come right. together. And yep. um, so you created, so you recorded this EP based on your experience. First of all, I love your voice and <laughs> you know how to bring a song to life. So as I was listening to the songs, the one that stuck out the biggest to me was bitter. Listening to it, your wounds are still open and they're raw. Uh, even, even the line in the song, you took all the gold and all the glitter and I'm trying to smile, but I'm still bitter. At least you were honest about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a journey too. And yeah. to be honest, uh, when we wrote that song, I wrote it with two other friends of mine, Jay Denton and Aubrey Toon. And the original chorus was, it was called Grateful. And it was about saying how all these horrible things have happened, but I'm choosing to find gratitude. I'm choosing the good and I want to believe in the good. And we left the session going, I just was like, I'm not there yet. I was like, I really am not there. This doesn't feel truthful and honest. And we, re I get, we gathered back together and, um, and readjusted it to find the chorus that currently is there. And I said, that's honestly where my heart is. And, you know, you think about writing music and what message you want to put out into the world. And I'm a generally positive person. And I, I want this message and my album and the music that I make to be encouraging mm -hmm. and touch people. But there is power in truth. And my case was so specific that I'm like, someone, if I, if I have felt bitterness or if I have felt that, I'm sure other people have too, especially if they've been in a situation like I have and have felt silenced this whole last year. They need to hear this song. Right. And maybe they've been through relationships that have been broken or lost jobs or, you know, been been hurt because of these mandates, or maybe they just went through a breakup. Essentially, Wait, this is well, my breakup well, city, but it feels like it could be any yeah, other. Yeah, what I love about this song, Bitter, and I'm glad you call it Bitter, Not Grateful. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the only problem in Nashville at the moment is if there's too many happy songs. <laughs> uh, we got to get back to the real stuff. But Let's what I love about this song, and ladies and gentlemen, look, we we all have walked down a path of being done wrong. Uh, we can have feelings of of bitterness, and it's just real life. Okay, trying to say that you're not bitter when you are it makes you a liar. <laughs> okay. So Laura, and even Nate, for you, Nathan, as well, I mean, how is the journey mm -hmm. uh, from going from bitterness and trying to forgive those, even those that may, you don't even know, maybe you don't even know their name, uh, mm -hmm. who put out this false narrative, how is that journey to forgiveness at the moment? Well, one of the things I think we've tried to do is, is let each, each emotion you know, recognize that the bitterness, that's a valid emotion. Now you can't hang out in bitterness too long because then you get, that can, that actually starts to kill you. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that stuff's not good for your body. It's not good for your spirit. But so I think first it was like being hurt, right? And then you have to go from hurt to anger and then let that, like that emotion sit there for a second and go, okay, but now I need to move on to something else. And so I think right now we've been in a season of forgiveness and that's, that's been really wonderful for us. I mean, it's not always easy. But I think it's important that you you intentionally have to start to go, okay, you know what, I release these people. I release this person. This was said about me or this was said about you. Like, you know what? That hurt, but like we're I gotta I gotta let go of that, even for my healing, even for my sake and my family's sake, and where I'm going, I can't hold on to everything 
that I, that I felt in the past. And that just doesn't belong to us anymore. So it's like, we've been intentional to do that. And some days you kind of go back to the, to the hard stuff. You're like, man, now I'm bitter or I'm hurt again. And, but it's like, you know what? It's, it's, it's just keep moving forward here. Yeah. And, and Nathan, you, you said it and ladies and gentlemen, look, we can get bitter by being hurt, but you don't want to live there. And Nathan, you said it perfectly because even the Bible says it goes down to the marrow of our bones, which means it will kill us from the inside out. That's right. And it is okay, ladies and gentlemen, to be angry. God allows us to be angry. That's being honest about your situation. And then we allow him to move in and around us to bring us to that point of forgiveness. And look, and I know both of you, I mean, I know what it's like to be hurt. And every now and then, the thought of what had happened pops into your head, and you're trying to push it and cast it down and tell yourself everything's okay. But sometimes you have to kind of walk through that emotion to finally let it, let it out the door, so to speak. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It took, you know, a year. My album came out two, within two days to the year of me moving, of me arriving in Nashville. And so you know, it took a whole year before I was even willing to talk about it, to even do interviews. I just was in, I wasn't in a strong enough place. I was a mess a lot. And so to finally be at the point where I can talk about it coherently and actually see the positive goodness that has come from it. And to be able to say, I took something horrible and made art from it that I hope impacts and inspires other people that have maybe been through something similar or not. You know, I, I hope that with my specificity, it's also very universal. Um, and yeah, to be, to be at the point now where we can look back and begin to forgive and take those steps yeah. toward us moving forward and well, not holding everybody to right. that standard. Well, I think you also have written a wonderful love song called Anywhere. And I have to ask, is this about Nathan? Oh, yes, it is. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the song initially, I mean, we... We, after, literally five days after our honeymoon, we packed a U-Haul and drove to New York and we jump started our lives together, lived there for 13 years. When COVID hit, we ended up kind of relocating to Connecticut for a season and not really knowing where home would be until we went back to New York. And then when all this happened, we never went back to New York. Nate and I had actually booked a Hallmark movie and I was in Vancouver filming while Nate moved all of our stuff down to Tennessee and I flew home to our new home. In Tennessee. Left one home and then flew back to another. <laughs> and so the song Anywhere, essentially the chorus is like, I could be happy anywhere as long as I'm with you. And it's that, you know, kind of an homage to home is where the heart is going. It's not a building. It's not a city. It's where, wherever you are with the person or people that you love. Well, I think it's going to be the song of choice for many weddings, uh, many anniversaries. So I, be- you know, <laughs> that, one, that one song it is, you know, and I love songs like that because they become so powerful, but they create a memory in so many other people's lives that here's this one song that you write, you put it on this EP, but that one song will be a memory for thousands upon thousands of other people who will take time to listen to it. And ladies and gentlemen, I know that when you hear the EP on the other side, part one, can't wait for for part two there, Laura. You know, that uh, you're going to fall in love with these songs, but I love the fact that you're just so transparent, uh, so honest. Uh, But I have to ask, what made you choose Nashville as the new destination? Sure. A few things, actually. Nate has family in Memphis. Um, His mom's side is all there. Moved from Minnesota over the last few years. So... um, that that was nice. And yeah, my we brother's ourselves... a doctor there, actually. So yes. that's yeah. <laughs> we found ourselves kind of coming down here a lot for that. I have a business partner in Nashville, and then Nate also has a production company in New Orleans, and has done a couple films there. So we found ourselves coming down here a lot. It felt like Nashville also had a very lively music scene, a lot of you know creativity culture, and, creativity, yep. great food, and all of that, um, as well as the peace. We live in Franklin, actually, so we're in a suburb just outside Nashville, and. Um, downtown Franklin is so adorable and charming. And I just feel like priorities shifted. And the minute we got out of New York, like our heart rate slowed down and we experienced what like is peace this? again. Peace. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> After running on the hamster wheel for like 15 years, which was great. Yeah. For we loved season. it for what it was. It for was sure. great. Um, but yeah, it's, we have just loved it here and it's been you know so, so welcoming and wonderful. And we still kind of, I feel like we have the best of both worlds here. 
Well, it looks like Nashville looks very good on both of you. So I know the city well. I filmed there for three years. Uh, love the city. Uh, love the people. It's always fun to go back. Uh, for both of you, well, let me ask you this, Laura, especially with the, the new EP, uh, is there a full album in the works? And I have to say thank you because it's very rare that I see albums coming out of Nashville that are not country. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a country album, uh, but it is an absolute beautiful collection of songs on this EP. So is there a part two coming or is there going to be a full LP coming? Yes, the, the goal is to, to come out with part two. I have a bonus track that's being released in January or February, and then another probably five or six tracks for part two to hopefully make a full record from. Maybe we'll do a vinyl, maybe we'll do CDs. Do it. Does anybody do CDs anymore? I don't know. <laughs> um, but right now it's only available digitally. Um, and then, yeah, as far as the style, everybody immediately was like, well, what's what genre? You're in Nashville, you're going to do country? And I was like, I don't know my genre. Like, I've only ever done musical theater, literally. So I think I went through the process with this EP of, fig of finding my voice, like musically, you know what I mean? So it's, it's in more ways than one, I'm finding my voice here. And I've always leaned toward a little bit of more kind of folksy singer songwritery, which I feel like this album, you know, leans in maybe a bit of a country direction, but it's not full blown country yeah, at no. all. It's yeah, kind of a- No, no, I found, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm the type of person, well, because I have so many recording artists as guests yep. and I sit there and I listen. And it's not just like listening, oh, that's a great song. No, I like to listen to see where the songwriting was going. Mm -hmm. Is there a story behind that song? Uh, but when I listen to these songs, definitely not country. Uh, yeah. I would say more in today's style. I would probably, if it was going to be on the, it, being on the radio, it'd be more in the pop genre, but not in happy pop, more pop in the areas of what I would say, like Adele. Okay? Yeah. I would put it in that category. Um, again, your voice is absolutely beautiful. Uh, there's a smoothness. There is this uh, this flowing style that you have that is so relaxing to listen to. But there's an emotion. You know, it's kind of like when I tell people, uh, so and so can sell a song, meaning when they sing it, you're believing every word. So when you sing it, I believe every word that you sing. Cool. Thank you. You're it bringing it. And it Nathan, I have to ask you this because uh, being in Nashville, uh, what are you doing now there? I mean, because uh, you had mentioned photography as well as uh, production. Yeah, and I get to I get my hands uh, in, got got my hands into Laura's project a little he bit. Did, he too. did the artwork. He did the cover. I, I played work. drums on a couple of the songs, but yes, uh, he did. But I also have a production company in, in New Orleans, so I'm I'm working down there a little bit. We've got a couple writers that we're partnering with, trying to get some some stories, TV show up off the ground, and uh, those things sometimes take time. But there's a couple projects too that Laura's pinned uh, pinned pinned to for us, and. Uh, Hopefully in the next uh, couple of years here, we'll we'll have some stuff coming out and, and more to talk about. Yeah. Well, so Laura, how's your how's your relationship with Hallmark? Um, to be quite honest, I did not get asked to do a movie this year, and I think a lot of it is because of what happened last year. I lost I lost three significant jobs and really have not been invited back into the public workspace that I once was a part of. So I'm curious, I think maybe um, a lot of the buzz is beginning to die down. Um, people might be willing to <laughs> open that door again. I really, you know, I saw a lot of true colors within the theater industry. And right now I'm not looking to return to that world at all. Um, I feel like I'm in a new season of, again, re-identifying, re finding my voice and, and using my gifts in a, in a different way that doesn't need to be a part of that space. So- um, But the I conversation also is changing from what it was a year ago. Yes. And the conversation right now, and even in the entertainment industry, and you do, do have, some restrictions and with SAG and, um, you know, SAG after, you rules know, and things. things being lifted and conversations being had to say, Hey, like, let's, let's get, uh, some of these artists back, back on the screen and, and company producers dropping mandates. Broadway still has, uh, you're still not allowed to work on Broadway if you're not vaccinated. So there's, there is that happening still, but, um, 
you know, it's a different conversation. The TV film industry has always been a little more uh, individual in projects as opposed to like a blanket mandate. Um, And I would welcome the opportunity to return to the screen. I have loved my experiences working with Hallmark and whether it's that or some other TV film opportunity, I I would be very open. Well, you know, it's funny because you're right. The, the mandate or the rules would be different between, let's say, filming in a soundstage versus filming on location outdoors. So I can see where, you know, rules can be either strict or lenient. And it also goes from state to state. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, Hallmark, if you're listening and watching, you need to be making a one very important phone call right now to this particular person because... You know, here's the way I look at it, uh, Nathan and Laura. Uh, I tell people, read the research and don't trust the science. Right. Okay? Right. Because this polarizing situation has got to stop. And yeah. we need to stop throwing daggers at people. You know, we live in a world when everybody says, uh, we should have the choice to do whatever we want. Then why don't you just shut up and give us that choice? Right, totally, absolutely. <laughs> There's a big prediction right there. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, for some reason they keep yelling choice, but then they don't want to give it to us. Right, But right. Uh, We're both really tolerant. You. Go, you no, go ahead, Laura. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, we're really tolerant unless you think differently. And then, you know, you can't, you can't sit with us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're right. You know, a lot of mandates are changing. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, so for Hallmark, Lifetime, GAC... Look, not only is Laura picture perfect for any film, I will tell you this, uh, Nathan, you've got the look, man. I think you may need to go out for some auditions. I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. (laughs) Seriously, you know, you got the look, you got the name. I mean, come on. I mean, I could even see a possibly a, a romantic comedy where you both are doing the leads. There we go. go. I will get you a guest spot on it. I would love that. I've only been, I've been on, I think I've been on one film set and uh, it is the greatest experience just to watch. You know, a friend of mine was, was a, was a great film director and it's just fun to stand there. Of course you spend more time standing around than actually watching filming, but the process is so addicting. But, uh, For 2023, what is next for both of you? I hope to be putting out part two of this album and continuing to songwrite. And I think that will always be a facet of what I do now. Um, I'm doing this residency show in Nashville. It's called Shiners. And it's like a Cirque du Soleil, Vegas style comedy musical. It's really eclectic and I'm having a ball. It's really fun. Um, and then hopefully some TV film projects if that door opens. That's right. Well, we're we're gonna we're gonna stand in agreement with all three of us that Thank those you. projects are coming and they're gonna come with an, an amazing overflow. And I know that all of my viewers and listeners can find out more about you at LauraOnus.com. And Nathan, what about you? Is there a place more people can find out about you? I got a little bit of photography out there, Nathan Johnson, uh, photography.com. But uh, also my production company is full, Ar- full armor films.com. So, yep. all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please to learn all things, Laura Onus and Nathan Johnson, her husband, uh, head over to LauraOnus.com And of course, uh, Nathan Johnson photography is that Nathan Johnson photography.com. That's it. All right. And we- we'll have that on the screen for all of you. And again, what do I always say, ladies and gentlemen? You buy the LP. And Laura, if you if you plan on touring on the album, I want all of my viewers and my listeners to go buy a ticket to watch her perform that EP. But again, buy that EP. It is an absolute stunning collection of songs. Again, my two favorites, Bitter and Anywhere, both transparent and healing. And of course, Anywhere is an extremely wonderful love song so ladies ladies and gentlemen and i'm going to keep saying it i'm just going to keep speaking it forward just like god spoke the world in six days not only by her ep but keep your eye out for her and you never know you may see nathan on the Ah. silver screen (laughs) thank you so much for both of you for both of your time it's been an honor and pleasure to have you on the show today 
Thank you, my friend. It has been a pleasure. Really, Thank really you, really Dr. Sweet Ward. Of you. Appreciate All it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, stick around because I'll be right back after these messages.